speech. Um, <laughs> let me pray, and then we'll get started. Father, I thank you for all the women that are here. I thank you for the women who I know are live streaming, who have been asking me about this um, time together tonight. And Father, I know that I need refreshment from your word. I know that every day I need my perspective to be refreshed, and I also need to rest in who you are. Uh, life's demands sometimes are crazy, and we get so caught up in so many things, overcommitment, and, and we're so often just so exhausted. But you invite us to rest, and as we look at that tonight, I pray that every woman who is here or watching or listening or who will listen later will truly be refreshed and have her focus back on who you are and that you would um, encourage us in a way that only you can. I ask for your grace. I ask for your presence here tonight. I ask you to help me as I walk through some of these principles with my friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I, I, I'm calling this the right kind of rest, and we all know that um, just regular life, regular life brings so much stress. Regular life brings overcommitment. Any of you ever feel overcommitted? Um, regular life brings so much to do. It brings constant demands. It brings realistic expectations and unrealistic expectations that we place on ourselves and then so often adding to the stress over commitment and more to do we add homeschooling to that because I know that a lot of you are here because you homeschool and that's another layer of overcommitment that, or that can seem like overcommitment and another layer of stress and a another layer of demands not only the demands of your family and your children and what you have to do anyway as a working mom and I'm not talking about a working mom outside the home I'm talking about a working productive mom inside the home then on top of that, there's so many extra things to worry about. Am I teaching them enough? Am I missing something? Are they going to be mad at me? Am I being lazy? Am I not paying enough attention? All those things, which we feel those things anyway as women, but then we have that extra layer. So um, I'm always encouraged by what Jesus said in Matthew 28. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, we take his yoke, take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Interesting what he says in those verses. Now we know that God is a God of work. We know that. We know, too, if we know our Bibles, that God created us to work, that work is not part of the fall. Work is not sinful. He created us to work, and he created us to work productively. He created us to work efficiently and to work very, very hard. We're supposed to do that. God gives us a great sense of satisfaction when we accomplish productive work. We don't have much um, satisfaction when we do unproductive things even though we're busy and we're spinning wheels but if it's unproductive there's not much satisfaction that comes from that and we also know from Genesis if we know our Bibles that God commands us to work we know from Genesis 1 God's, God tells us this God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth and then in Genesis 2 verse 15 he says then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden and he gives him his job to cultivate it and to keep it and we also know that God set the example of work in his creation Jesus we know from scripture came to do the work that his father had given him and God commands us once again to work and not to be lazy now for our purposes tonight we're not going to 
necessarily look at the principle of work, we're not really going to discuss unproductive, non-focused busyness. I think we all know what that is. I think we've all experienced that. I think we've all probably, if you're like me, have spent a good portion of your life in that kind of work, non-productive, busy work, just busyness. But tonight we're going to look at God's kind of rest, and I hope that you'll be refreshed. And I know even this morning, as I early this morning as I went through this this, you know, in the wee hours of the morning, once again, it was like, I was just so refreshed looking at God's word and what he says about it. And it was like a, a rebuke and a reminder to my own heart. And I guarantee if your heart is open, you will be rested and refreshed by the time you leave. And you'll be thinking about a lot of things that maybe you've been, you've needed to think about for a long time. And no matter how busy you are, how tired you feel, how exhausted you came, I believe God will do that in your soul if you are open to him and you listen to him. Of course, I know that God wants us to follow his example concerning rest. We already know, I've already told you that God set the example of work. And sometimes, at least for me in my life, I've concentrated on the work and his command for me to be productive and busy in my work that often I have neglected how God also wants me to rest. God spent all of Genesis 1 telling us his work in creation. He told us every, what he did every single day. And the psalmist in Psalm 8 set, tells us to consider the work of his fingers, the moon and the stars which he has ordained. And then in Genesis, again, in verse 31, in Genesis 1, he says, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth, and this is the beginning of chapter 2, thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, he completed his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Think about this. We're going to talk about this. He blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So what we're seeing here is that God set aside the seventh day for himself because in it, the Bible tells us, he rested from all his work. God rests. He's setting this example, and he isn't even tired. I mean, so why does he rest? It begs that question, why does he rest? I mean, he's God and all, and he not, doesn't need the rest. Well, he, obviously, we can learn from Scripture that he did it as an example for us, of course, as an example for us. And also, we see that he's enjoying the fruit of his labor. He's seeing that it is good. And, of course, this is at creation, ever before he gives the laws. So keep in mind that the Sabbath is not just about the Ten Commandments, although we see it in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, you know. But rest is a part of creation before the law something God wants to teach his people. God works and he rests right in creation. You know, I, tell, I teach a women's Sunday school class and I've been telling them lately, I said, it all goes back to Genesis. It all goes back to Genesis. Everything goes back to the first chapters of Genesis. There's so much. You can never, ever, ever mind the depths of the beginning of Genesis. And, and the thing is, is that's why anyone who casts doubt on the historicity and the accuracy of Genesis 1 to 3, just don't even listen to them. It's, I mean, this is what God has told us, and it's such a foundation for everything that he tells us after this. So God works, and he rests way before the fall of man, way before we as sinful fallen people would even get tired and feel the need to rest. The second thing that we see is that God wants us to obey his commands. God really does command us to rest. Now, in Exodus 20, you find this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or, for your, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days, he's reminding us again, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. 
So what does it mean for us? I mean, God wants us to keep one day out of every week set apart in a special way for him. Keeping this one day holy means to separate it. He wants us to do our work in six days, and then he wants us to worship him. Now, obviously, he wants us to worship him every single day, but it's a special day on the seventh day to be set apart. And again, it's not for laziness. It's not, once again, for unproductive busyness, but to focus on the things of the Lord in a special way. And of course, in the New Testament, because of Jesus' resurrection on the first day of the week, Sunday is the day that we set apart. You can write down in your little notes if you want, Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 2, if you want to look those up later. But we're to follow God's example, and we are to obey his commands. Deuteronomy 5 gives us another picture of rest for the Sabbath. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Once again, he says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you so that your male servant, your female servant may rest as well as you. Not just you, but all these who work for you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So we see once again God setting apart for his people this day. And here you see in Deuteronomy that he's saying one of the things he wants them to remember is that they were slaves and that it was God who brought them out. They might be thinking about that during those six days. There's lots of things we think about during the six days. But then, you know, when we gather with God's people, and we come here and we hear the word taught, and we are around God's people, it's like set apart. We're reminded of things that we might not be focusing as much during the week. It's set apart in a special way. Because it's true that in the everyday routine of life and all the things that we have to do as women and that God calls us to do and commands us to do, even those good productive things sometimes it's easy to forget what God has done yet God wants us to remember this he wants us to remember too that we were slaves you know before we got before he saved us we're slaves to sin we're slaves to ourselves I mean that's what the Bible teaches that we had another master and it wasn't the Lord and we were headed for hell. And, and God wants us to remember that, that we didn't save ourselves. It's not by our works or how good we are or how much we go to church or that I'm protecting my children or that I've decided to educate my children at home and all the good things I'm doing for my family. Resting and reflecting once, one day a week, setting it apart, shows that we really love Christ. It shows our faith in the Lord. It, our observance of the Lord's day shows that we depend upon him and that we want to be not only with him in a special way, but we want to be with God's people and serve God's people in a special way. And it reminds us of our salvation, that he saved us, and we're not slaves anymore. It reminds us that we were once foolish ourselves, enslaved, the scripture says in Titus chapter 3, to various lusts and pleasures. We were hateful, hating one another. It's good for us to be reminded of what we are without Christ. It's good for us to be reminded of what we would be without Christ. We should remember that so we don't pat ourselves on the back and think we're so awesome, because we're not. God saved us, and he's the one who quote unquote makes us awesome for his service. You know what I mean. <laughs> but you know, it's so important that we do this. It is, you know, today a lot of churches don't even remind God's people of this. You know, they go to church to feel good about themselves, not told the truth about, hey, you were hateful, hating one another. You were enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. That's why you need a savior. Because when you understand that of what God saved us from, then it changes the way you see everything. It changes your perspective. And of course, when we don't emphasize that, when God's churches don't emphasize that, it's no wonder people are so ungrateful. When people, when, and I'm talking about Christians, when they, you know, things don't go their way or when tragedy strike, strikes their families or when they have tough days or when the kids are being sinful or they're not doing what they're told and they're being disobedient. You know, when, if you were here Wednesday night and you heard Todd Wilson talk about, you know, it's hard but it's good. 
You know, it's like, and I often say when I teach the Mother from the Heart Conference how Carl and I married, we, when we got married, and he's a godly man, and by God's grace, I wanted to be a godly woman, but we were like hateful, sinful people. And two people, just because you love the Lord, you get married, you're still sinners. And then you have, all, you have five children, we have five children, and they're sinners. And so then you got seven sinful people living in a house, and of course there's going to be stress. Of course there's going to be hard times. Of course we have to remember that. But God saved us. And we want to walk with him. Now, so God established a weekly rest. Six days labor, one day rest. But God also established a whole system of festivals for his people that he outlines in Leviticus 23. And I'm not an expert on these, but I do know what they are. There were four in the spring. It was Passover, week of unleavened bread, first fruits, 50 days later, then Pentecost, nothing in the summer, then three in the fall, trumpets, day of atonement, feast of the tabernacles. And the reason I bring those up is because they were spring festivals and fall festivals. A whole year for God's people kind of turned on these festivals. Three times a year, men would go to Jerusalem and have holy days. And there was to be no work done. So God's showing us that it's not just rest within the week but rest within the year. Every civilization has these kinds of things. I mean, we do here in America. I mean, we have the New Year. We have Valentine's Day. We have St. Patrick's Day. We have Easter. We have Mother's Day. We have Halloween. We have Thanksgiving. We have Christmas. We have Memorial Day. We have Labor Day. We have Veterans Day. We have Fourth of July. I mean, you could keep listing all these things that are festivals that we celebrate in America. And we typically set aside our our normal routine, you know, like Memorial Day. <laughs> Carl and I went to a restaurant. We're like, nobody's here. And we're like, oh, yeah, people are having barbecues. You know, it's like they do something different. They have family over. I know when my mom was alive, she would have a Memorial Day picnic uh, often. You know, it's like you do something different. The family gathers. So we do kind of the same thing. But we have to ask ourselves, too, are the ways we celebrate these times, times of real rest, or have they become a time of stress? I mean, think about it for a second. You know, it used to be a long time ago in our America, everything was closed on Sunday. Now, why do you suppose that was? It was because, well, I mean, we know why that was. We know why, because of the way our nation was founded. Closed on Christmas and then on Thanksgiving. Those were two days back in the day that you could count on that everything is closed. Because you wanted to give people a chance to rest. So they didn't have to show up to work. They could have a rest. And of course, Good Friday was a special day a long time ago. And Easter Monday was special. But so many of these things are not special anymore. And we all know that now with our technology, you can rest, but you're always working. Which is or can be a really good thing. I mean, really, it can. Working remotely, that can be a good thing. But also, it has its drawbacks. We know that because we know we're distracted. We're here, but we're not here. We're with someone, but we're not with someone. Because work calls, and it's often not work. It's other things as well. But there's something else in Scripture. In the seventh year, God said that farmers were not to sow their crops. The ground was to lay fallow so that it could be restored to be more productive. Now think about that for a second, just that principle. Something to lay fallow so it can be restored to be even more productive. I mean, think about that just in terms of your life. And of course, for a farming community, that requires a, a lot of faith because people are earning their living from the land. No planting crops for a year. Yet God said that the farmer was not only to rest for one day out of the week, but yeah, one year out of seven. And beyond that, the sabbatical year, was, there was the year of Jubilee. Every 50 years, there was to be a time when, when slaves and prisoners would be freed. Debts would be forgiven. Absent family members would go back home. The land would be returned to its former owners. Weekly rest, yearly rest, sabbatical rest. Long-term rest, God says there's seasons of rest. 
Again, Exodus 34, verse 21, you shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest, even during plowing time, and harvest you shall rest. Now, you know, God is showing us that even at the busiest times of life, we're supposed to take time to rest, even when we're homeschooling and worrying about so many things with our families. And I'm going to tell you something. I have often been so guilty in my life. I look back over my life of raising my family and where I, you know, all the things I was doing. <laughs> and I, I can see that so often I was guilty of ignoring this principle. There was a time in my life, and I want to tell you my motives were because I wanted to please the Lord. I wanted to do everything right for my family. I, I mean, I, I wanted to do everything so I was teaching st Sunday school in church because I wanted to employ my gifts in the body of Christ. God tells us where to do that. I was teaching Sunday school. I was doing scripture memory with children's choir. I was teaching woman's life both day and night. And we used to meet a whole lot more than we do now. I was a leader in Awana. I was in the nursery regularly. I was teaching in every special ministry such as vacation Bible school and other Bible studies women's conferences that we used to have both fall and spring and of course all the while I'm homeschooling my children every day and then we would pull our resources and do homeschool classes and I would lead those some of those as well I was writing a newsletter I was teaching my children I was supervising their schedules I mean on and on and on and I wanted to do it all well and I wanted to do that work for the Lord Again, I wanted to employ my gifts in the body of Christ. I wanted to be a good model for my children. I wanted to be all there for them. And of course, as I'm telling you these things, I'm kind of overwhelmed just thinking about it. But at some point, I realized, because I didn't do this forever, but I realized I was totally skipping at least one night's sleep a week. Why was I doing that? It was intentional. I was intentionally doing that so I could do things because I didn't want to take away that time from my children during the day. And I remember sometimes thinking that I wish I could divide myself into like seven people because I wanted to do all those things. It wasn't something that somebody was making me do or somebody says, you better do it. And I wasn't doing it out of guilt. I wanted to do those things. It wasn't because I felt like I had to. I wanted to make the most of my days, as Ephesians says. Make the most of your days because the days are... I didn't want to be lazy. I wanted to please and serve the Lord. But I had the mindset, I have to keep working because I don't want to be lazy. I don't want to be slothful. I think I was sometimes mixing up the need for real rest with slothfulness. And at some point during those years... God began the process of revealing to me that to be the most productive for him, I had to have times of restoration. And I had to drop some of those ministry things that I was doing and hold on to the ones that were most important to me. And that's what I still do to this day. Now, times of restoration, what does that look like? Well, I'm certainly not talking about entertainment. I'm certainly not talking about non-productive activity. I'm talking about restoration. God's saying, again, even in the busiest times of our lives, he wants us to get the right kind of rest. Now, I'm going to talk about the restoration in a few minutes. But I want to point out to you that when um, God was leading the Israelites into the promised land, God said this to Joshua. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you are to cross this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess it. I mean, he's giving him work to do. To the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God gives you rest. And will give you this land. The Lord your God will give you rest. And will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But you shall cross before your brothers in battle array 
all your valiant warriors and shall help them until the Lord gives your brothers rest as he gives you. By the way, this is in Joshua 1, verses 10 to 15, for those of you who are like, where was that? And they all also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise. So here's the thing. I mean, I don't know. When I read that, it's like they were going to work and to fight to do what God commanded them to do. But God says in the midst of that, he was going to give rest to them. I mean, there's, you know, we need to think about that. He's going to give the rest. It comes with changing our perspective. It comes with this whole thing of seeing things differently, refreshing the way we view these things. So we follow God's example. We obey him, and then we're to accept. when When he commands us to rest, we're to do it. You know, Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now think about the next part in verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Think about those words, lie down in green pastures, beside quiet waters. Makes me, leads me, and then he restores my soul And then he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I mean, think about those words. I mean, David here is referring to the Lord as a shepherd. And that's what David was. He was a shepherd king. A shepherd takes care of his sheep. A mother takes care of her children, meeting all their needs. And God wants us to rest in him, not worrying or wanting. God is the source of spiritual restoration. That's what this passage is telling us. And as a shepherd leads his sheep to quiet waters for rest, the Lord restores and refreshes the soul. But sometimes he has to make us lie down. I mean, absolutely make us. Now think about this for a second. Think for a moment as it relates to maybe a tired toddler that you have or used to have. You have to make them lie down sometimes. You don't say, hey, how about you go in there and lay down for a second? And I know that there is a probably a little segment of the population that where children like love naps. I know that I've, I've been around children like that, but most of them don't, especially boys. You have to make them lie down. Why? Because they need quiet waters. You need quiet waters. And he needs to be restored. Now think about that in those times when they're in that nebulous in-between time. You know, they're kind of like, don't go to sleep as soon as you make them lie down. But they want to stay up. And then they stay up, and they go past the time where you're like, they're they're miserable, they're making you miserable, and they're hysterical, but you don't dare put them down then, because if you put them down then, they're going to wake up at 8 p.m., and then they're going to be up all night. Well, at least that was my experience. Y'all are just looking at me. (laughs) But I'm just saying that that's like, You know, God's showing us that we should understand this as women, that that sometimes God has to make us lie down. He has to lead us to quiet waters, and we, of course, in turn have to do that with our families. But there's a spiritual lesson here. The Lord provides forgiveness, he provides restoration, and he provides peace for those who do what he commands. And there's also the practical lesson. As we walk with the Lord, as we follow him moment by moment, he leads us to rest in very practical ways. And he does it without our clamoring for the world's stupid ways. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. You know, and I remember when my children were little, and sometimes they were getting up at the crack of dawn, going nonstop with them all morning, loving, playing, teaching, training, and it was really was one of the most fulfilling times of my life. I loved it, and God gave me the energy for it. But with all that energy, productive busyness, and constant motion from the crack of dawn till just after lunch, I was ready to make them lie down in green pastures. (laughs) I enjoyed their nap times. And that's not because, don't ever feel guilty if you enjoy your children's nap times. Enjoy it, it's good. And that's not because you don't love being with your children. It's because they need it and you need it. And even children when they get older and then the homeschooling years or, or however old they are, everybody needs some downtime. 
You know, sometimes I remember a young mom asked me one time, you know, is it bad that my, my child's like too old to take a nap, but then I still need, feel like I need the time? And is it okay for her to just be in her room for the two hours where she used to sleep and just have... I said, yeah, give her books to read. That's fine. Don't feel guilty about that. She needs to be away from you too. You know, I'm just saying there's, that there's, you give them productive things to do. That's okay. I mean, don't leave them in there all day long. But, you know, we're having some downtime. This is our rest time. Here's the things you can do during the rest time. And you do it. Now, during those nap times when my kids were growing up, I never wanted to take a nap. Probably I should have sometimes. But I never wanted to because, you know, you think, I can do this and get this done and get this done. I only have these, like, this little slot to do it. You think in blocks of time. But I wanted to use that time for other things that I need to get done without my children under, feet, under my feet. But some days when I read to them before they took their nap, I would just fall asleep with them. Sometimes just for 30 minutes, but that 30 minutes took the edge off. It was like God making me lie down in green pastures, leading me to quiet waters. And then he restored my soul. And I became more productive as my ground lay fallow for those 30 minutes. So did they. Psalm 37 verse 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Be still and know that I am God. Now God, what you can see here is that God is issuing this invitation to rest. He wants us to do this. I just read it in that opening verse. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, and you'll find rest for your souls. So, he's, it, so that's what he wants. And then he wants us also to heed his warnings about not resting if we don't listen to him in this area. Because there are consequences from refusing to rest. We've already talked about the consequences sometimes when, when we don't lead our children and make them lie down in green pastures and then it's like we're just dealing with some hysterics until a normal bedtime. But Isaiah 28, verse 12 says, He who said to them, Here is rest, give rest to the weary, and here is repose, but they would not listen. You saw me at God's people, they wouldn't listen. Isaiah 30, verse 15, For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest you will be saved, in quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing. Jeremiah 6, 16. Y'all have all heard me quote this many times. Thus says the Lord, Stand by the ways and see, and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in it, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We're not going to walk in that. We're not going to do that. And of course, God's speaking to his people in those days, and the people are turning away from him in those days and refusing to rest his way. God is also speaking to us today. We refuse to rest, and when I say rest, I'm talking about his way. We refuse his way of rest, his kind of rest. Spiritually, obviously, we refuse the rest that salvation brings if we refuse salvation but physically, too, when we don't give our heart and souls the rest that they need and our bodies, and we pay for it in all kinds of physical and spiritual ways. I mean, the Christian life, y'all, is a long journey. I mean, it's short in the grand scheme of things. You know, eternity past, eternity future, and we're a dot. But it's a long journey, at least from our our perspective as we live down here, even though at my age, I look back and say, wow, these years went by so fast. You think that too, no matter what age you are. It's just the older you get, the more it seems it, was, it got on warp speed. But God wants to renew me and you day by day, and I need it. You know, as a woman, as a pastor's wife, as a homemaker, as a mother, as a grandmother, an older woman in the church, I mean, I'm just like you. I seem to have a job that is never done. I often tell people, especially when somehow they think because my children are grown and gone from my house that my life is less busy. And that's not true. My life is not less busy. It's just a different busy. I have pockets of time, but my time is filled up because I want to serve the Lord well until he takes me home. 
I take my jobs and my roles seriously that God has given to me. I have not adopted the mindset like so many people my age that say I've paid my dues, I've raised my family, now I'm going to go play the last half of my life. I don't think that way. And my house has always been full of people who have needs, who create messes, who need me. Ever since I got married, my house dynamic continues to change as yours does. And with it, my mind and my heart go up and down, thinking, okay, at this stage in my life, I want to live my life well. What are my priorities? What do I want to spend my time doing? How do I want to organize my days? And then, of course, with births, with illnesses, with deaths, with aging parents, with not enough space or hours in the day to do all the things that God wants us to do, how do we get renewed? Now, we all know, I'm sure you as well as I do, we know the cultural answer. It's like, take care of yourself first. You need me time. You deserve a break. You get away from the change that binds you. You just run away from it all. You meet your own needs. You take care of yourself first. And I'm not talking about in the biblical sense of taking care of yourself, okay? I'm talking about the way the world views these things. Whole books have been written to tell women to be selfish, and to live selfishly and not focusing on the way God tells us to rest and to take care of ourselves. They're, they're not written from the standpoint of godliness and placing limits around you and doing, you know, uh, focusing on the things that you cannot not do. You know, I, I, when I teach, uh, when I've taught, you know, a series called Seasons of a Woman's Life, I like break it down into negotiables and non-negotiables. And the non-negotiables are things that, that, there's no way I would ever not do these things. And I make those my priority, but then there's things over here that I can. Sometimes I might can do those, other times I can't, but those are the things that at times I don't, I don't need to do. God's kind of rest is being recharged so that you can go back and do what God has called you to do. And it's not always a nap. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's a run. Sometimes it's, I mean, there, you can think of all the ways that where you feel restored, where you, where you feel refreshed. Now, I know the American cultural way is just to watch, you know, TV. And there can be things on TV that are refreshing and that are, good for the soul, so I'm not, or movies or whatever, but so many of them are just like, get, it brings up all this angst, and I'm not talking even about things you need to know about, like things that, you know, I was just reading a, a sad story about a, a little girl who just died, a pastor's daughter from a freak accident, and I just wept like a baby when I read it. I'm not talking about those kinds of things that you have to be informed of. I'm talking about when we're like, oh, I just want to unwind, and so I'm going to turn on some, like, ungodly movie to watch. That's not going to restore your soul. I mean, think about it. If entertainment, the way our culture views it, if it really brings restoration of the soul, then tell me why that people are so exhausted at the end of those things. And there's a place for entertainment, and I'm all for it. I'm for those family vacations where you come back and, and you're exhausted because your kids had a great time and you got all those memories. So I'm all for that. And there's a different kind of you know, goodness that comes from that, even if it's exhausting. So we're not talking about those kinds of things. But entertainment in terms of the stuff that, is, that we know we shouldn't be filling our minds and hearts with, it does not restore the soul. You know, my daughter texted me a, few, a couple days ago after a, a busy uh, after a busy, good busy time they had with their family and they were gone for a few days and she said um, I'm having a stare day and then uh, she sent me a beautiful picture outside with her kids and I knew what she meant because she grew up with me saying we just sometimes need a stare day where I heard it from an older woman she's a stare day where you're just, you're just staring you're, not, you're just staring you had so much going on in your life. It's like, 
And, you know, I responded in a text. I said, stare days are good for the soul. Because they are. There's like quiet waters. It's like going for a walk and just not having anything in your ears, not listening to a podcast, and all that can be good too. But just sometimes just hearing the birds, just going for a walk, even if it's 10 minutes, that's restorative. Just walking down somewhere and just sitting out in your yard or in your neighborhood where nobody's around, and if somebody comes and says, hey, I'm having a stare time, can you? I'll talk to you in a little bit. (laughs) But, you know, our culture is so hedonistic. We pursue with a vengeance personal pleasure. And we think it will produce rest and, and release of soul and body, but it doesn't. It just doesn't. I mean, we want to unwind. But those kinds of things are what our culture pushes on us. is not the kind of rest God is speaking about in Scripture. And we have to help our children with this. I mean, think about it. They don't need to be entertained every single moment of their day and weeks and years where everything is filled to capacity one activity after another because because i know what that feels like you think oh oh i got to make sure they're doing this and this and this and this and this and we don't give them any stare time you know just to go see i mean i i was telling my husband today i said i remember when i was a child and i loved the month of june and it was because, you know, school, the academic year was filled with homework and school and chores and all that stuff, getting up at the crack of dawn and then, you know, school all day, then homework at night. And then, you know, we had to, like, clean the kitchen. We had to, like, clean up after dinner. Our mother didn't do that for us. We had nights to do it. And it was, like, just more work until you went to bed. And, I, and those were good times. Of like, I, I loved all of that. But I really loved June because school was done, and we didn't start working in tobacco until July. Now, that's just my story. I worked in tobacco. <laughs> Can't change it. I did. <laughs> and that started usually in July, and it was, like, Backbreaking work even for a little kid like me. And I, but there's lots of fun at the barn and with everybody. So there was lots of fun with that, but it was hard work from the crack of dawn until the evening. But June, we worked in our family garden. We picked blueberries and sold those, but it was so much more laid back. And those are the times I could just go lay in the grass and look at grasshoppers because there was no like screens. There wasn't any of that stuff, and I'm not down on screens. I'm just saying there was time just to think about the fort we were going to build out in the woods. And kids need that. It's okay for them to have those times where it's not, and if they say I'm bored, say, well, you know, if you're bored, you either think of something to do or I'll give you something to do. Now, my kids always said, don't worry. I got stuff to do. And they would have their stare days or their stare moments or their quiet water moments. But, you know, in Ezekiel 34, God calls out false shepherds for only caring about themselves and neglecting the sheep. He says this, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down on good ground grazing ground and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed feed them with judgment. I mean, you see all this. He wants to lead them to rest. He says, I will do this. I will feed you and I will lead you to rest. God who gives us all this work to do also leads us to rest. 
And of course, we see this with his son, Jesus, because Jesus models rest. Mark 4 says on that, in verse 35, on that day when evening came, he said to them, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in a boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there arose such a fierce scale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I mean, what do you see here? What Jesus is doing? Middle of a storm. They're all concerned. What's Jesus doing? He's resting. He's modeling taking a nap in the middle of the storm. I mean, they had to wake him up. He was sleeping so soundly. I mean, how could he sleep so soundly when there was such a fierce gale of wind, when waves were breaking over the boat and the boat was filling up? Well, you have to think about the work that Jesus had just done. He had taught all day, giving out, giving out, answering questions, dealing with people outside all day long, exhausted. Have you ever been that exhausted where you just hit the pillow and you fell asleep? You just collapse, and a train could come through the room, and you wouldn't even hear it. Mark 6, verse 31, and he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place. Here he is inviting them to rest, and rest a while. That's what he says. And then in parentheses, you see in that passage, for there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. I mean, Jesus is the one who said they needed to go away to a quiet place so that they could rest. And this was right after they had heard the news about the death of John the Baptist. You want a tearjerker? Read that account. And how they hear about, I mean, read the account of his death and how he worked and he died. And then they hear about it. And then Jesus takes them away to a secluded place so they could rest. He knew they needed that time of restoration because the ministry was going to get even more demanding I mean, Jesus was incredibly busy. He was in the throes of a demanding ministry. And he was God, yet like God in creation. He took time to rest, and he led his disciples to rest. And also like God in the Psalms, Jesus sends out that invitation to rest. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even even of the Sabbath. I mean, the Pharisees had this legalistic one day a week. I mean, it became a burden more than a rest. And Jesus was challenging them. He was reminding them that God made it for them to rest. And I already read to you, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then at the end of the ministry of Jesus, when the sins of the Jews are, I mean, when all of this is bearing down on him, he warns the nation about their refusal to rest, to enter his rest. He said this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. I mean, a hen doesn't nurse. No, she just provides rest under her wings. It's the image that God is giving us in his word. And he's showing us that because he wants us to rest in him under his wings. God provides rest through him. I mean, Romans 15, he says, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Now urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He's asking them to strive in their prayers with him. And the reason he's doing that is, and he gives the reason, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, that, I'm, that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. And he's saying he wants to get away from those people who are persecuting him so he can accomplish the work and then he says when he accomplishes the work verse 32 says so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company do you see that it's like rest doesn't mean not working Working is doing what God's called us to do, not non-productive busyness, not spinning our wheels, not filling our minds and hearts with all the way the world says we're to rest. 
It's to be restored in him. And there's a restoration that comes in doing the things that God's called us to do. And then as we ask people, to, as we're praying, as we're doing what God calls us to do, then there's much joy in it, and we find refreshing rest. I mean, and he's saying here so he can find refreshing rest with them in their company. He says, in your company. Do you have people in your life by just, who just by being with them, you are refreshed and rested? I mean, just by being with them, not because you took a nap. I mean, you know, I had to, I mean, I feel that way after my grandchildren come and spend time with me and stay with me. I mean, I had like two of my granddaughters here a week ago. And I, you know, we, we just had the best time. And it was so refreshing. It was refreshing to talk about the Lord. It was refreshing just to do fun things with them. It was refreshing to hear them playing the piano. It was refreshing. In the one day, one of the days they, they, were, doing, they were doing something with someone else, and, and when they came back that day, I mean, all that day I missed them. I was like, they're here in Buford, and they're not with me. <laughs> I'm saying it was a super busy week. We did so many things. But when they went home, I was just felt so refreshed just being with them. It was restorative to my soul because we didn't just do dumb stuff. I, wouldn't, I, I wanted that week. I always think of it when, my, when I have my grandchildren. I think I have, whether it's three days or whether it's five days or whatever it is, I have this much concentrated time and I want to like invest as much as I can and do what they want to do and, and invest and, and talk about, I always pray for our time, Carl does too, we're just, but it's striving, working, being with them and then rest and, and refreshing rest in their company. That's what he says. And that's why it's so important who you spend your time with. You know, you can be with some people who just, you're not restored after being with them. Now, and I'm talking about companions here. I'm not talking about people that you need to help. I'm not talking about ministry things. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I'm just talking about who your companions are. Revelation 14, 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors. He says rest from their labors because they were working, and they were working doing what God had called them to do. And now they're resting from their labors for their deeds follow with them. So I hope you see from this, God calls us to work and work hard, but he also calls us to rest, but to rest his way. You know, it's like, it's like sin that brought stress-filled work. So I guess a few summary points, if I can make them, for, especially for homeschooling moms. Make sure your work and rest are proportional. I mean, just think, through, think it through. I mean, you've got Jesus' example. You've got the example of the po Apostle Paul. Ruth is a good woman example. I mean, she was a hard-working woman. I mean, you know how Boaz's workers described her? You know, they just, I mean, they just said, you know, she's been working all day. She's the young Moabite woman, and she's been working hard. She came back with Naomi. She's been taking care of her mother-in-law. And she's the one who said, let me glean in the field. Let me work hard. And she's out there working in the fields. And, and remember how they said, she's been here all day long working. She's been sitting in the house just for a little while. And, of course, you know the story. Boaz took notice of her, and she became his wife. God provided rest for her. And also, think about this. No matter where, where you're home, whether you are homeschooling or not, sometimes you have to set work aside. You just ignore the cobwebs for just a minute. You know, if you're like a clean freak, it's okay. They're not going to remember the cobweb. But they'll remember that you didn't that that's all you talked about. I mean, sometimes just let it go. I'm not saying always let the cobwebs go. You know, I took cobwebs down yesterday. But sometimes, you know, again, we're talking about, about sometimes. I mean, I, we always say, you know, there's women over here that are, that are the clean freaks, and there's women over here that are the messy ones, and the clean freaks say, well, I have to keep my house super clean because people live here. And the messy women say, I have to keep, I mean, my, the reason my house is messy is because people live here. So somehow we got to, 
But Luke 10 says, Now as they were traveling along, he entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary who was listening to the Lord's word seated at his feet. We all know this passage. It's very familiar. And no matter how many times I reflect on it, I still learn from it because so many times women tend to think like this, you know. Only one thing is necessary, and that's what Mary's doing. That's kind of lazy, isn't it? Just, we can't sit around all day. Even at the Lord's feet. What about all the tasks that need to be done? Yet the problem is Jesus is the one who said only one thing is necessary. Hmm, how do we deal with that? Simplicity. You know, he's talking about simplicity here. I mean, think about the superlatives that he uses about Martha. He says, you're worried and bothered about so many things. He says, all your preparations, all the serving, so many things. And so God's telling us that Martha probably took on way too much, more than she could possibly do. Have you ever done that? Way beyond her ability. Have you ever done that? I'm thinking, I don't know why this is going so poorly. Well, because I don't know how to do it. She piled it on. And probably out of her love for her Lord, but instead of dropping things that she wasn't doing well or letting something go, she thought she had to do it all. And in the process, she stressed herself out. She fussed over the dinner party. And so much so that she didn't fuss over Jesus. So at some point, you know, she's just deciding to work harder, do more and more and more to make things happen, and then she just complains about her sister. So she criticizes her sister, criticizes the other woman, what she's not doing. And so she get, develops a critical spirit. And he just tells her, hey, you're worried and you're bothered about so many things, but, you know, Mary's chosen the good part. And it's not going to be taken away from her. And it's not about personality types here, y'all. All of us have Martha moments. Every single one of us have times like that in our lives. And we all have Mary moments. The question becomes what characterizes each one of us. It's not about personality types. I know it's been, some people teach it that way, but it's not that. It's one event. It's one time in the lives of Mary and Martha. And at this particular time, Mary makes the right choice and Martha was distracted. And by implication, I mean, the Lord tells us very, he's very clear who has not chosen the good part. And here's the thing. It doesn't mean that feeding people and serving are not important. The lessons, the food preparation, all the things you do, they are super important. But you're not supposed to get stressed out about it. I mean, I know we do. So with Martha, the problem with Martha was not what she was doing. What she was, what she was doing was good. And you notice in Jesus' rebuke of her, he's not rebuking her service. He rebukes her worry and how she's doing it. He's rebuking what, what her focus is. I mean, she could have been focused on the Lord while she was serving. She could have. You know, so God shows us so much through that particular passage. And then, of course, you know, another point of uh, encouragement is to keep it simple, sweetheart, kiss, not keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, sweetheart. <laughs> you know, the Shunammite and the preacher, you know that example from Scripture, how she makes that little room for the preacher. He's coming through, and she doesn't make it fancy. She doesn't go overboard. She just knows the preacher, Elisha's coming. She wants to make a little room for him. So she gives him a bed. She gives him a, a chair and a lamp stand. She didn't do a bunch of extras. And I know, I love the extras. But sometimes it's just the simplicity of things. Not fussing over everything, just being simple with it. And sometimes there's plenty of time for all the extras, but there's sometimes like, no, 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 we don't need to worry about that. We just need to focus on this. 
we get caught up in the excess and that's very dangerous it's very dangerous even for us as we scroll through social media and we see all the things that everybody else is doing and all the extras in another way I mean, it's not just in the physical realm of maybe homeschooling your kids. and Well, they're doing this, and they're doing this, and I better get this, and I better do this, and, you know. But it's in every area. It's like, whoa, I should be doing that with my hair, and I should be doing this with my skin, and I should be doing that with, oh, and I should be dressing like this, and I should be doing that. And we're just, like, worried and bothered about so many things. It's dangerous. Kiss. Keep it simple, sweetheart. And sometimes that just means limit what you're looking at what you're comparing yourself to and who you're comparing your kids to. And also another little common sense thing is just know that the dynamic of your home and the seasons of your life are always in flux. They don't stay the same. What you're dealing with right now with a stubborn child is not always going to be that way. He or she as you train and teach here a little, there a little, and you're constantly helping them, they'll get to another point. They will finally reach, they'll get through it. I could give you example after example after example about all the things I worried about and all the things I stressed myself silly over. And I was like, wow, God was just really faithful. That's why I always say that. God is just so faithful. I do what he's called me to do, and I let him work his magic. We know it's not magic, but I let him work. You know that, but your life shifts, and that's okay. I mean, it reminds me of Hannah. Remember when she had, finally had Samuel, and she chose, you know, she chose not to go to the temple. You know, she she just chose not to go. It was time for the yearly sacrifice, and Elkanah, her husband, was going there to pay his vow. But Hannah didn't go that time. She said, I'm not going to go up until my baby's weaned. I'll bring him then, and he's going to appear before the Lord, and he's going to serve the Lord forever. Don't you think about that? It's just like, you know, you have this short window of time with your kids. It's like, just don't wish for the time later on. That time's going to come soon enough. Just wait and do what you need to do today and ask the Lord. If it's overwhelming for you, ask the Lord to calm you. Ask him to make you lie down in green pastures. You know, ask him for that. Ask him to lead you beside quiet waters. Ask him to restore your soul and to see these things from his perspective so so her husband i mean she was a godly woman she makes this decision and she says that to her husband he respected her because he knew she was a godly woman especially after everything they had been through and he says do what seems best to you hannah you that's fine the lord will confirm his word so she did that's what she did and his day of releasing the day of releasing samuel was coming just like the day of releasing our children. It's coming, and it's coming sooner than you think. I mean, I still remember one time when my child was kindergarten, when one of my children was kindergarten, as they were entering kindergarten, and I was thinking, you know, because, you know, again, home's going them, and I was thinking, I'm so glad I have 12 years. I'm just so glad. And they're gone. And when I said that, I still remember saying it. I remember where I was looking at that child and thinking, I got 12 years. And they're gone. Now, we still have a great relationship. But I mean in that way that I can stay there and take care of him and nurture him and train him and give the best of my hours and days to him. And that's what you see happening with Hannah. She was one of those women. She sensed that part of her life was going to come to an end with Samuel. But it was also going to be the beginning of another. And she knew that with time, her life would change. Y'all got to remember that. If, you have, you know, if you're a brand new mama with one little baby, your life will change. It doesn't seem like it now. But it will, but that's, that's growing in wisdom to recognize the seasons of life and where we are in that continuum. 
You know, and she knew that. She knew as her child grew, her life would need adjusting. She was going to have more children after that, too. So she's a picture of a very godly woman who knew what was most important in the season of life in which she found herself. She didn't use the season of life as an excuse. Well, you know. God gives us wisdom to know the seasons of life. And as I just said, 18 years with each of my children, those 18 years, you know, when they're growing up in your home, they're all gone. But I also know that I have now a whole new generation of young women to pour my life into, starting, of course, with my family, and then a whole new generation of young children, starting, of course, with my grandchildren. And I don't want to miss it. You know, there were some things when my children were little I couldn't do, but there were other things I could do. Window of time to tuck them in. Window of time. Windows of time, that's what we have. And I'm in a new season, a different season of life now, and it's no less important. I don't want to miss this season just the way I didn't want to miss the season as my children were growing up. Same thing I felt when I was taking care of my mother in the last years of her life. I thought, I don't want to miss this. I remember saying to my daughters-in-law and my daughter at Thanksgiving, we were all in the, in the kitchen, and I didn't know how much time the Lord was going to give my mom. I knew that she was 90. I knew, you just know the stages of life. I didn't know if, it, if she would be alive another year, another two years. I don't know, but I do remember saying to them, I want to love her well until God takes her home. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss what God wants to teach me. And I don't want to miss what God wants to teach her. And I don't want to miss the example that I'm giving my children and grandchildren. And I think we should feel that way about every season of life we're in. That we don't want to miss what God has for us. So... I, I, I hope, like me, you're always evaluating and assessing your family's life, where you are in the continuum. It's so important that we walk with God moment by moment, that we rest in him, his way. Let him lead us. And right now, right now, where we are in America, where things are upside down, that we still walk with God and we rest in him and we know that he is faithful in every single generation. You know, I guess just to sum up, we have to walk with the Lord. We have to know that God's called us to work hard. We are to labor but we are also to rest hard. And I hope it's been clear enough as we've walked through some of this that God's rest is different from the way the world tells us to rest. God's rest is restorative. God tells us that his grace is sufficient for all of life, no matter where you are. If you're a first-time mom, if you're in the middle of homeschooling six kids, if you're in the middle of being an older woman and trying to figure out how to be a mom and grandmom to your adult children and to your grandchildren, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, if you're in piles of heartache right now, God will give you piles of his grace. He just will. If you're in the middle of one of the busiest seasons of your life, just piles of it, he will give you piles of grace to walk through it. And he will lead you to rest in the middle of it. He's our shepherd. And he will find you. And he wants to restore your soul. He wants to take you through your overload. For your stre uh, he wants to take you through your stresses. He wants to take you through your overcommitments. He wants to take you through your unrealistic expectations. He wants to take you through any depression you might feel about whatever's going on in your life through any busyness that you have, through any loneliness that you may feel, through any heartache, through any joy. I think one of my favorite verses in the Bible of all time is Isaiah 40, 11. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock and gather the lambs in his arms, holding them carefully, 
close to his heart, gently leading them home. Because here's the thing, in the most stressful and uncertain times of life, God gently leads us. He carries us. He's our shepherd. We are his sheep. And in the middle of all that's going on in our world, he leads us to find rest. Now, I started this message with, this, these verses, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, help us to grow. Help us to find rest in you no matter where we are in our season of life. Father, I especially pray for the homeschooling moms who have taken on this task of educating their children at home. There's so many things available to them, so much out there, so much sometimes it is overwhelming and even confusing. But I pray that you would help them to understand the very real need that they have to rest your way, to look to you, to walk with you. And as my daughter-in-law said recently, that sometimes we can sound like a broken record talking about how much we need to read our Bibles, walk with God moment by no moment. But Father, it's so true. It's just so true. It's in your word and who you are that we find our true, that we find our true rest. Father, help those who are listening or who will listen, whose hearts are restless. And some of them may not have even come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. They haven't entered the rest of salvation, of, un of knowing that they can never earn their way to heaven. They can't do enough good deeds to be accepted by you. It's only through your death, burial, and resurrection. It's only through the death of your Son and his resurrection and our trust in that that brings us new life. 